Chapter 3 Fireball Residents of Trollskull Alley are shaken by a loud whoosh, rattling windows, and the screams of city folk. A fireball spell has been detonated in the street, and the neighborhood is thrown into chaos. As members of the City Guard, the City Watch, and the Watchful Order of Magus and Protectors rush to the scene, the characters are afforded a chance to assess the damage and investigate further. This incident sets into motion the main plot and puts the characters on a collision course with those who want to find and claim Lord Neverember's hidden cache of gold. The fireball goes off early in the morning, at a time when all the characters are in Trollskull Manor. Read aloud the following description. Windows rattle as the roar of an explosion fills Trollskull Alley. Charred bodies and anguished screams fly through the air. A thick cloud of acrid smoke billows outwards from the blast, which seems to have occurred right outside of your door. Let the players tell you what their characters are doing in the moment, and how they react to the explosion. Those who want to guess the nature of the explosion with a successful DC-13 Intelligence Arcana check can conclude that someone just cast a fireball spell outside. What's happening here? Delacar, a rock gnome spy working for Lord de Galt Neverember, was on his way to see the characters when a fireball went off, killing him and ten other people. The gnome is important because he was carrying the Stone of Galore, the key to finding Lord Neverember's hidden cache of gold. Hounded by agents of the Zentarum, the Xanatha Guild, and Bregan Durth, Delacar was unable to escape from Waterdeep with the artifact, so he planned to entrust it to the characters briefly for surely the folk who rescued Lord Neverember's son could keep it safe where he could not. By the time the events of this chapter have played out, the Stone of Galore has changed hands a few times, and the characters have learned more about the big picture, though they still have a long chase ahead of them. Zents caught in the act. Three members of the Black Network, including the Zent assassin, Erstel Floxen, were close to nabbing Dalakar when they were caught in the blast. Of these three, only Erstel survived. Though he was wounded, he was able to pluck the Stone of Galore from Dalika's pocket before fleeing the scene. While other survivors were coming to their senses, Erstel stumbled through the smoke and haze and eventually made his way back to Grolhund Villa a short distance away. House Grolhund The heads of the Grolhund noble family, Yala Grolhund and her husband, Aurond, are providing coin and shelter to Erstel and his fellow Zents in exchange for the promise of getting their fair share of the hidden cache of gold. But the Grau Huns aren't willing to put their trust entirely in the Black Network. They sent out their own agent to shadow the Zents, eliminate Dalakar, and obtain the Stone of Galore on their behalf. Yalar gave the would-be assassin a necklace of fireballs, with instructions on how and when to use it. When it seemed as though Dalakar might give Erstel Floxen the slip, this agent hurled one of the beads from the necklace to stop the gnome in his tracks. The Grauhund's assassin is a nimble rite that escaped from the House of Inspired Hands, the Temple of Gond in the Sea Ward a month ago. The construct hitched a ride on the House Grauhund's coach. Yalar Grauhund befriended it, offered it shelter, and used it as a servant until she and her husband found a more sinister use for it. Nimble Rite A Nimble Rite is a magical construct created to serve as a guard or assassin. Composed predominantly of lightweight wood and powered by magic, it can pass for a humanoid while wearing clothing. Some Nimble Rites wear plain clothing, while others are clad in flashier attire. A Nimble Rite is emotionless, its face frozen in whatever expression was given to it by its creator. Duelist a nimble right moves like a dancer and fights like a swashbuckler, using dodges and parries to avoid damage while deftly skewering its foes. Construct Nature A nimble right doesn't require air, food, drink or sleep. Damage it takes can be repaired with a mending spell, but a nimble right reduced to zero hit points is permanently destroyed. The incident with the fireball has strained the alliance between the Graal Huns and the Black Network. Erstel Floxen is refusing to hand over the Stone of Galore until he speaks with his secret master, Manchun. Meanwhile, the Graal Huns are weighing the risks of betraying and murdering Erstel in their own house. If the character's investigation goes well, 
they'll blunder into this den of snakes before the chapter is done. Unraveling the plot. During their investigation, the characters should learn who or what cast the fireball, a nimble rite, why the attack was committed to steal the stone of Galore, and where the stone was taken, Gralhund Villa. If the investigation stalls, friendly NPCs might step forward to help in exchange for compensation. One such figure is Vincent Trench, the private detective who lives in Trollskull Alley. The characters can also consult with friendly factions such as the Harpers. The Crime Scene In the wake of the explosion, people emerge from their houses and shops to survey the devastation. The fireball didn't set any buildings ablaze, but it left 11 people dead. One elderly female human who was out for a walk. No one recognizes her. Two cloaked human males, Zemtarum cell swords, clad in leather armor and sheathed longswords. Two female humans and one male half-elf dressed in plain clothes. Servants of wealthy Northward families killed while running errands. One male gnome, Dalakar, wearing a burnt cloak and clutching a dagger. Two female halflings who were playing a flute and a fiddle, and two male halflings who were dancing. The characters have only a few minutes to search the crime scene before the members of the city guard arrive. After that, they aren't allowed anywhere near the bodies, although invisible or other similarly hidden characters can search the crime scene further. A search of the bodies accompanied by a successful DC-15 wisdom perception check reveals the following. One of the dead male humans has a black winged snake, the symbol of the black network, tattooed on his right forearm. The dead gnome has dry waste on his boots and cloak, suggesting that he spent time in the sewers recently. He also has a pouch containing five 100 gold piece gemstones. A character can try to snatch Delica's pouch without being seen by a non-player character onlooker. Doing so with a successful DC-13 dexterity sleight of hand check. On a failed check, the character still acquires the pouch, but someone observes the theft and reports it to the city watch constables once they show up. This witness to the theft can be silenced with a bribe of 50 gold pieces or more. After the blast, the characters have a few minutes to examine the crime scene before the city guard arrives and cordons off Trollskull Alley, posting six guards at each entrance. The guards don't allow anyone in or out without permission from a superior officer. Another six guards, including a sergeant, with 18 hit points, makes their way to the crime scene and watches over the dead bodies until the city watch arrives. Lingering smoke from the fireball also attracts a griffin cavalry rider. As its griffin mount circles the neighborhood, the rider watches the streets and alleys for suspicious figures. City Watch The City Watch is Waterdeep's police force, charged with keeping the peace and apprehending criminals. City Watch patrols are usually 4 to 12 persons strong, a patrol expecting trouble might have reinforcements in the form of a priest on loan from one of the local temples, or a mage from the watchful order of magists and protectors. Ranks in the City Watch Members of the City Watch are called officers. Their ranks are, from lowest to highest, Constable, Sergeant or Amar, Lieutenant or Civilar, Captain or Senior Civilar, Leader of a Watch Station, Major, Ward Civilar, only one per city ward, and commander of the watch. The watch also includes a senior arm master who reports to the commander of the watch and is in charge of supplies. The commander of the watch reports to the open lord, Lairil Silverhand. Game Statistics Most city watch members are veterans. Some of the higher rank members are knights. All city watch members wear helmets and carry clubs while on duty. The city guard the City Guard is Waterdeep's army, charged with protecting the city walls and gates, government buildings, harbour and officials. The City Guard also patrols the roads to Ampale, Goldenfields and Daggerford. Ranks in the City Guard Members of the City Guard have ranks. From lowest to highest they are Private, Sergeant or Amar, Lieutenant or Civilar, Captain or Senior Civilar, Multiple command positions, some paternal, such as Seneschal of the Castle of Waterdeep, Defender of the Harbour, 
Master of the North Towers, Master of the South Towers, Master Armourer. Others bestowed as needed in wartime, the Lord's Hand and the Lord's Champion. Wardens of Waterdeep The current Warden of Waterdeep is Elaminster, who answers to the Open Lord Lairil Silverhand. The Griffin Calvary is a special branch of the City Guard whose members are veteran soldiers trained to fly Griffin mounts. Game Statistics City Guard privates and sergeants are guards. Members of Lieutenant rank and higher are typically veterans. The Watch Arrives 20 minutes after the explosion, a City Watch Sergeant named Saith Cromley escorts a member of the Watchful Order of Magus and Protectors named Barnabas Blaswind to the crime scene. Barnabas quietly takes charge of the investigation at that point, while Sergeant Cromley directs a force of 20 constables, or veterans, to knock on doors and question locals. Saith Cromley Saith Cromley is a retired sergeant of the City Watch, a likeable fellow with a sharp sarcastic wit. He occasionally comes out of retirement at request of Barnabas Blastwind. He assists the mage in investigating unusual crimes in the city. Cromley helps Barnabas relate to the common folk, and he is good at coaxing information out of them. Though Cromley was once a strict proponent of the watch regulations and dress code, he has grown a bit lax in both matters now that he's officially retired. Game Statistics Saith Cromley is an Alaskan human veteran with these changes. Saith is lawful good. He has a charisma of 14 and intimidation of plus 4. He speaks common. Barnabas Blastwind Barnabas works for the watchful order of magist and protectors, investigating crimes that involve the use of magic. He comes across as prickly and secretive, confiding only in Saith Cromley, a retired sergeant of the city watch who assists in many of his investigations. A lifelong bachelor, Barnabas has a small, tidy estate in the Sea Ward that he inherited from his grandmother. When not serving the Watchful Order, he spends his days reading and writing books in his library. Barnabas uses spells that help him investigate crimes, pry secrets from the minds of suspects, and locate missing persons. He finds violence appalling and would never use his magic to inflict harm on others, even those who harm him. Before allowing the corpses to be removed and taken to local temples, Barnabas inspects the scene closely and reaches the following conclusions, which he prefers to keep to himself, but might share with other members of the Watchful Order. The gnome was running from armed pursuers, of which there were three. The third person who was chasing the gnome wasn't among the dead. The gnome and his pursuers were moving towards the tavern in Trollskull Alley, which Barnabas will soon come to realise is the character's property. Neither the gnome nor his pursuers saw the blast coming. Given these findings, Barnabas decides to question the tavern owners and occupants, with Sergeant Cromley by his side as a witness and bodyguard. Specifically, Barnabas wants to find out the gnome's identity and whether he was known to anyone. The characters, having never met Dalakar, have little information to offer unless they decide to lie. Neither Barnabas nor Sergeant Cromley is quick to jump to conclusions. They both prefer to have ironclad evidence and testimony from reliable witnesses before making any arrests. Even though the characters are suspect by virtue of their proximity to the crime scene, it hardly seems plausible that they would unleash destructive magic so close to their place of business in broad daylight. Consequently, Barnabas intends not to take up too much of their time. Barnabas and Sergeant Cromley refuse requests by characters to join the investigation. That would introduce too many new variables into an already confounding equation, replies Barnabas with a frown. Trust in the watch, Cromley adds dismissively. Characters who seem truthful and honest can press Barnabas into further information by making a DC-15 charisma persuasion check. On a success, they nudge Barnabas into revealing what he has discovered as outlined above. Eyewitnesses Many other people witness the fireball without being caught in the blast. Three of them have important information to share. Any character who spends at least one minute talking to one of them learns what the person saw or heard. No ability checks required since the eyewitnesses are eager to talk. Fala La Fear Fala, the owner of Corellian's Crown, relates the following information. I was watering the plants in the greenhouse on the second floor of my shop when the blast blew out some of the windows. Luckily, I wasn't injured. 
Through the smoke, I saw a cloaked man take something from a body of a dead gnome, then start limping away. He was badly burnt and casting glances over his shoulder, like he was afraid someone might be following him. He was headed towards the bent nail. Fala saw Erstal Floxen fleeing the scene with the Stone of Galore in his clutches. He circled around the bent nail on his way out of Trollskull Alley. Jezrin Hornraven A water Davian born of wealth and privilege, Jezrin was leaving the tiger's eye, having hired Vincent Trance to spy on her philandering husband, when she witnessed the following. I tell you, it was not a man, more like a puppet shaped like a man, a puppet without strings. It was on the rooftop. It hurled something into the crowd below that caused the explosion. I saw those halflings burn alive. I saw them. Jezrin doesn't know what the puppet hurled to cause the fireball. She took her eyes off the thing during the chaos and doesn't know where it went. Martem Trek This 12-year-old boy watched as his halfling friends perished in the flames. He didn't see much beyond that, but he found something important after the blast went off. Right after the explosion, I ducked behind a rain barrel. Then I heard plop, and I found this in the barrel. Martin produces a necklace of fireballs with two beads remaining and a broken clasp. As it fled across the rooftop, the nimble right accidentally yanked on the necklace, which came off, fell to the roof, slid off the edge, and plopped into the rain barrel next to Martin. He doesn't know what to make of this object, but was planning to keep it. A character can snatch it from him or convince Martin to relinquish it with a successful DC-8 charisma intimidation or persuasion check. Characters who withhold the necklace and knowledge of it from the City Watch are guilty of a crime in Waterdeep. Hampering justice by concealing evidence can result of a fine of up to 200 gold pieces and hard labour for up to a 10 day. Speaking with the victims. The dead are taken to the City Watch station in the North Ward and kept in a cellar morgue. Clerics from the local temples are brought in to cast gentle repose spells on the corpses to preserve them while the investigation is ongoing. Any character who has a renown of one or higher in Force Grey, the Grey Hands, the Harpers, the Lord's Alliance, the Order of the Gauntlet, or the Zentarum, can petition their faction representatives to hire a cleric to cast Speak with Dead on one or more of the fatalities. The characters can hire a cleric themselves by making a donation of at least 25 gold pieces to the cleric's temple for each casting of the spell. They must also provide a list of questions they want answered. A Speak with Dead spell can pry some or all of the following information from Dalika's corpse if the right questions are asked. Dalika stole an artifact called the Stone of Galore from the lair of a beholder known as Xanathar in a dungeon deep below the city. Dalakar worked for the Open Lord of Waterdeep. Here, he refers to the Galt Neverember, whom he believes is the rightful Open Lord, not Lairul Silverhand. The Stone of Galore is key to finding a horde of dragons hidden in the city. Dalakar heard about a group of adventurers who rescued Nord Neverember's son from the Zentarum and thought the Stone of Galore would be safe in their hands for the time being. He was on his way to deliver it to them planning to come back and reclaim it after he had eluded pursuers. Then the fireball went off. The following information can be learned by casting Speak with Dead on one or both of the Dead Zentarum swords. Their names were Bashek Ortalis and Wern Malcrave. They worked for Erstal Floxen and resided at Gralhund Villa. Their job was to help catch a gnome named Dalakar. Dalakar had some kind of artifact in his possession which according to Erstal Floxen, would make them as rich as kings. Nim Secret Characters who question Jezrin Hornraven, the eyewitness as previously described, can get a description of the creature that set off the fireball. It bears a striking similarity to the automatons that sometimes march in the Day of Wonders parade, as anyone who has lived in Waterdeep during the fall season knows. Because the Day of Wonders parade is sponsored by the local temple of Gond, Characters might want to visit the temple and investigate a possible connection. House of Inspired Hands The House of Inspired Hands, Waterdeep's Temple of Gond, sits on the corner of Sea Watch Street and Shark Street in the Sea Ward. If the characters visit the temple, they see the following. 
The House of Inspired Hands looks like a cross between a temple and a workshop. A symbol of Gond, a toothed cog with four spokes, is displayed prominently. You see the silhouettes of humanoid shapes perching on the roof. It extends an arm, releasing a tiny metal sparrow into the sky. The bird does fly a few loops in the air, then veers right towards you. The creature atop the temple is Nim, a nimble right. Nim was given to the temple as a gift from a visiting Lantanese wizard and has been creating its own inventions on the sly. One of those inventions was the nimble right that detonated the fireball in Trollskull Alley. Another less dangerous invention, a mechanical sparrow, is on an accidental collision course with the party. Have the characters roll initiative. Nim's mechanical bird acts on initiative count 10, has a fly speed of 60 feet, and starts 60 feet away from the characters. It has armor class 15, one hit point, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. On its turn, it flies towards one party member at random and makes a melee weapon attack with a plus zero to hit against that character. On a hit, the bird deals two or 1d3 piercing damage as it slams into the character with surprising force. On a miss, it crashes. Either way, it's destroyed on impact. After the attack, Nim withdraws into the temple's attic through a secret hatch on the roof and lies low, hoping the characters don't report the incident to the temple's acolytes. Inside the Temple The Temple of Gond is open and abuzz with activity during daylight hours, then closes from sunset till sunrise. At night, acolytes retire to their private quarters to work on pet projects. Hall of Exemplary Inventions the main hall of the temple holds two dozen marble pedestals. Each one bears a prize-winning invention or a miniature model of some other extraordinary creation. Among the displays are several that stand out. A four-foot-tall working model of a clock tower rings at the top of every hour. It is made of wood, iron, bronze and glass with brass bells and delicate hands formed of solid gold. A wooden flying machine has wings that flaps when it becomes airborne. A miniature model of a mechanical dragon turtle that has a brass plate affixed to its pedestal that reads, Big Belchy sank in deep water harbour on the Day of Wonders in 1363 DR. A functional walking helmet equipped with small articulated metal arms and hands that gently slap the wearer if he or she falls asleep. A miniature model of a red submarine, shaped like a manta ray that has a brass plate affixed to its pedestal that reads, The Scarlet Marpanoff, Lantanese Submersible, launched in 1489 DR. Meeting Valletta Characters are met by Valletta, a dragonborn priest of bronze dragon ancestry with these changes. Valletta is neutral. She has these racial traits. She can use her action to exhale a five foot wide, 30 foot long line of lightning, but she can't do this again until she finishes a short or long rest. Each creature in the line must make a DC 11 dexterity saving throw, taking 2d6 lightning damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. She has resistance to lightning damage. She speaks common and draconic. If the characters mention the figure that they saw on the roof of the temple, Valletta identifies it as Nim a nimble rite that was gifted to the temple by a Lantanese wizard. If they describe the incident involving the mechanical bird, Valletta sighs and leads them up a spiral staircase to an attic that Nim uses as a lair, only to find the attic's door fitted with a new lock. Valletta doesn't recognize the lock or have a key to open it, but the characters using thieves tools can pick a lock with a successful DC-20 dexterity check. A knock spell or similar magic also opens the door. Valletta won't allow characters to break down the door, but she does permit them to speak with Nim through the door. A character can persuade Nim to unlock the door with a successful DC-17 Charisma Persuasion check. Valletta grants advantage on the roll by strongly urging Nim to comply. Meeting with Nim Nim understands common, but can't speak. It has developed a simple sign language that Valletta and other members of the staff understand. After the incident with the bird, Nim hides amid a clutter in its lair, but it emerges if the characters find their way inside, or coax it into unlocking the door. If the characters ask about other nimble rites, 
Nim admits, though gesturing to Valletta, that it built other nimble rites to ease its loneliness. But the Nim's creation fled in confused terror a month ago, and Nim hasn't seen it since. In light of this revelation, Valletta angrily orders the acolytes to remove Nim's tools and unfinished inventions from the attic, while she forces Nim to look on. Nimble Right Detector Characters who search Nim's attic or watch the area as it's being cleaned out can find a one-foot-long copper contraption with an umbrella-like metal protrusion at one end. A detect magic spell reveals an aura of divination magic around it. If asked about it, Nim tells Valletta that it only built the device to find the errant Nimble Rite and tried to seek it out, only to discover that Nim couldn't leave the temple grounds. Once Nim explains how the Nimble Rite detector works, Valletta allows the characters to take it. To activate the Nimble Rite detector, the character must hold down its trigger. When the activated device comes within 500 feet of a Nimble Rite other than Nim, the umbrella begins to spin, whir, and click. The spinning, whirring, and clicking accelerates as the distance to the target lessens, reaching a maximum velocity and volume when a nimble right other than Nim is within 30 feet of the device. Reward If the characters want to track down the wayward nimble right themselves, Valletta says that the House of Inspired Hands will pay them 500 gold pieces to destroy it. If they return with proof of its destruction, Valletta sees that they receive the promised reward, and also offers them one each of the following non-magical inventions. Adjustable stilts. The stilts take one minute to put on or remove. They increase the height of any humanoid wearing them by two to five feet. Each stilt weighs eight pounds and is one foot long when fully collapsed. Backpack parachute. A human wearing this piece of gear can deploy the parachute as a reaction while falling, or as an action otherwise. The parachute requires at least a 10-foot cube of unoccupied space, in which it deploys, and it doesn't open fast enough to allow a slow fall of less than 60 feet. If it has sufficient time and space to deploy properly, the parachute allows its wearer to land without taking falling damage. Once it has been used, the parachute takes 10 minutes to repack. Barking Box This metal cube, 6 inches on a side, has a crank on top, Using an action to wind the crank activates the box for 8 hours. While activated, the box barks whenever it detects vibrations within 15 feet of it. As long as the box and the source of the vibrations are in contact with the same ground or substance. A switch on the side of the box sets the device to emit either a small dog's bark or a large dog's bark. Matchless Pipe A switch made of flint is built into the bowl of this fine wooden smoking pipe. With a few flicks of the switch, the pipe lights itself. Finding Nim's Creation Equipped with the Nimble Right Detector, the characters can search for Nim's escape creation. A ward-by-ward -ward search is the best approach, but let players tell you how their characters conduct the search. Depending on where they go, the search could take days. A character mounted on a griffin can complete a city-wide search in a couple of hours. To secure the use of a griffin, a character must either be a member of the Order of the Gauntlet on good terms with Savra Bellabranta, or a member of the Lord's Alliance on good terms with Jalesta Silvermane. As it happens, a young griffin named Bonesnapper has been trained to serve as a mount in the griffin cavalry. If Savra or Jalesta is inclined to help the party, the characters can arrange to meet the griffin and its trainer outside the river gate the following morning shortly after dawn. The griffin and its trainer normally rest aside Peaktop Airy, a top mount Waterdeep, but most civilians aren't welcome there. To gain Bone Snapper's trust, a character must succeed on a DC-16 Wisdom Animal Handling check. The griffin won't allow any character who fails the check to ride it. Nim's errant nimble right is in Grolhund Villa, on Sayadun Street, in the North Ward. It isn't, however, the only nimble right to be found outside the House of Inspired Hands. If the characters decide to search the Dock Ward, the nimble right detector starts to whir when it comes within range of a couple of ships in the port. Dock Ward Distraction Zardod Zord, owner of the Sea Maiden's Fair, has brought three ships to Waterdeep. Two of these galleons, 
the Heartbreaker and the Hellraiser, are docked. Zord's flagship, the Eyecatcher, is anchored in Waterdeep Harbour. Each of these three ships, as described in Chapter 7, have at least one nimble right aboard. The docks are bustling and chaotic during the day, except in winter. At night, darkness provides sufficient cover for characters to approach the docked vessels unseen. If one or more characters are caught aboard a ship, the crew tries to corner them until the ship's captain can have a word with them. The nimble rites, they say, are attractions and nothing more. If the characters speak to the owner of the fleet, a sending spell is used to contact Zord, who invites the characters to dine with him aboard the Eye Catcher. Dining with Zarda Zord Characters who accept Zord's offer are shuttled by Dingy to his flagship. Welcome aboard by Drow crew members, magically disguised as attractive humans as described in Chapter 7, and led to the captain's dining table in Area J-10. The dining table is bedecked with gold filigree, the purple curtains festooned with silken tassels, the wood panelling scented with perfume. A magnificent feast laid out on golden platters sprawled atop a mahogany table of exquisite craftsmanship. Even the doilies are something to behold. Standing behind it all with wine glass in hand is a well-built, scantily clad man, his scarlet apparel designed to accentuate his trim figure and bountiful chest hair. A flashy rapier hangs from his stylish belt. Welcome aboard the eyecatcher, he says, flashing pearly white teeth. Zado's Zord at your service. This dashing figure is none other than Jalaxel Banray, magically disguised as Zado's Zord. The characters have piqued Jalaxel's curiosity. He doesn't know much about them, yet, and wants to determine whether they pose a threat. They don't. To win them over, he shares the following information over dinner and wine. The Sea Maiden's Fair, owned and operated by Zord, is a seafaring carnival based in Luskan that travels along the Sword Coast. It provides good, wholesome entertainment in the form of fantastic street parades. The Heartbreaker and Hellraiser are used to transport entertainers, wagons and parade floats. The Eyecatcher is Zeld's commanding ship and private yacht. All three ships are built for comfort and speed. Zord visits distant lands of Latan about once a year. During his last visit, he purchased four nimble rites from a Lantanese wizard. He keeps two aboard his flagship, and one aboard each of the other two vessels. When they're not marching in a parade, Zord's nimble rites remain aboard his ship. They're perfectly harmless, he attests, whereupon a nimble rite holding a decanter enters the dining cabin and quietly refills everyone's wine glasses. If the characters mention the Stone of Galore, Zord shrugs his shoulders in a manner that suggests he doesn't know what they're talking about. He also feigns disinterest in Waterdeep's politics, saying, Every city has its problems, I suppose. My job as an entertainer is to make people forget about politics for a while. Characters who are suspicious of Zord can make a DC 24 Wisdom Insight check. Any character who succeeds on the check senses that there is much more to him than meets the eye. Jalaxel owns a hat of disguise, but doesn't need it to hide his true form while he's aboard any of his ships. His disguise, and all disguises of his drow subordinates, can be dispelled only by destroying the ship's figurehead, as described in Chapter 7. If the characters somehow discern his true form, Jalaxel gives the party a slow nod of his head, dryly says, Bravo, and lets them make their next move. When dinner is concluded, Zord bids the characters farewell and sees that they are escorted safely back to the docks. Drow Characters If the adventuring party includes one or more drow characters, Captain Zord pays close attention to what they do and say, but doesn't treat them any differently from other party members. What Rhaenyra Knows At some point during their investigation, the characters might want to speak to Rhaenyra Neverember about the fireball, given his own recent brush with the Zentarum. Conversely, he could decide to pay them a visit at their tavern. If he's told that the gnome and two Zents were killed in a blast, Rhaenyra drops a bombshell. When the Lords of Waterdeep ousted my father, I thought his long dark shadow was finally gone for good. The truth is, I want nothing to do with him. But his spies hound me. 
One of them, a gnome named Dalakar, had been watching me for months. Then, about two ten days ago, the spy was suddenly nowhere to be seen. My father didn't trust many people, but he trusted that gnome. I spoke to a few of Dalakar's friends. Apparently, he was on a special mission to retrieve the Stone of Galore and was afraid that the Zentarum and the Xanatha Guild were close to catching him. When he heard about my kidnapping, he wanted more information about the adventurers who had rescued me. I think Dalakar was planning to pay you to deliver the Stone of Galore to my father in Neverwinter. Any attempt to follow up Dalakar's friends proved futile since they have gone into hiding in the wake of the gnome's sudden demise. If the characters tell Reynar that Falar Lafir saw a man fleeing Trollskull Alley, Rhaenyr reaches out to his friends in the Harpers. A day later, he returns with the following information. The man Falar saw matches the description of Erstil Floxen, a suspected member of the Black Network. Another North Ward resident claims he saw Erstil enter Grandhol Villa in the North Ward shortly after the Fireball incident. The residents reported him to the City Watch because Erstel looked suspicious. Two City Watch constables spoke to Lord Gwal Hund. He assured them that no one has broken into the estate and that everything was fine. The constables had no grounds to get a search warrant, so they didn't pursue the matter. Gwal Hund Villa After fleeing Trollskull Alley with the Stone of Galore in his clutches, the Zent assassin, Erstil Floxen, returned to Gralhund Villa to confront Yalar Gralhund about sending the Nimble Rite to meddle in his mission. Lady Gralhund decides she no longer likes Erstil, and taking advantage of his injuries, wrests the Stone of Galore from him at sword point, and orders her guards to lock him up until she decides what to do with him. Your choice of main villain determines Lady Gralhund's motivation, which is secrets held by her and Harabaz, her loyal half-orc bodyguard. If Xanathar is the main villain, Yalar Gralhund has secretly cut a deal with the Beholder Crime Lord, offering to return the Stone of Galore to it if the Beholder helps her create a vacancy in the Council of Masked Lords. If the Casalantas are the main villain, Yalar is a fawning member of their Asmodeus worshipping cult and intends to deliver the Stone of Galore to them as a demonstration of her fealty and friendship. If Jalaxel is the main villain, he and Yalar are secret lovers. He has promised to facilitate her rise in power after he uses Lord Neverember's lost horde to buy Luskin's way into the Lord's Alliance. If Manshun is the main villain, he promised not to destroy Yara's family if she allows her villa to be used as a staging area for his secret plots. Believing that Erstel Floxen is after gold for himself, Yalar plans to cut Erstel out of the deal and deliver the Stone of Galore to Manshun herself. Having gravely misjudged and underestimated Lady Gralhund once, Erstel isn't about to do so again. Rallying despite his injuries, he manages to kill the two unattentive Gralhund guards who were watching over him and alert the other Zents on the estate who have been dispatching other guards and servants. Erstel's goal is to capture Lord or Lady Gralhund, force the surrender of the Stone of Galore and deliver it to his master Manshun in Colat Towers as described in Chapter 8. Erstel's plans, unbeknownst to him, are dashed when Lady Gralhund orders her Nimble Rite to take the Stone of Galore elsewhere. Amid the chaos, the Nimble Rite flees the estate. Should they or shouldn't they? The characters must proceed carefully, since they have no evidence that directly implicates the Gralhunds in the attack in Trollskull Alley. Their two basic choices are to share what they know with the City Watch or visit Gralhund Villa themselves. Let the Watch handle it. The characters can go to any city watch station in the North Ward and report what they have learned to the constables there. Shortly thereafter, the characters receive a visit from Barnabas Blastwind and Saith Cromley, who have no reason to suspect the characters are lying. Their own investigation collaborates much of what the characters said. Barnabas concludes the meeting by saying, rather brusquely, Thank you for the information, Cromley adds. Rest assured, We'll have this case resolved in no time. A magistrate provides the city watch with a warrant to search Gralhund Villa. 
Sometimes afterwards, Cromley visits the characters by himself, and as a courtesy, tells them what happened. The officers arrive to find Lord Gralhund unconscious, Lady Gralhund in shock, and their half-orc bodyguard bloodied but unbowed. Apparently the Gralhunds had been held hostage for more than a ten day by agents of the Black Network. Most of the Zents were killed during a bloody revolt led by Lord Gralhund himself. The Zent leader, Erstel Floxen, was among those who got away. He's still at large. The Watch plans to step up its search for him. Of the nimble right, there was no sign. According to the Graal Huns, the construct was delivered to Graal Hund Villa weeks earlier. The family took it in, not realizing it was a Zentarum spy. Lady Graal Hund reported that it stole her necklace of fireballs. Cromley's summary of events is based on information given to the City Watch by the Graal Huns and is riddled with falsehoods. The hostage situation, Lord Gralhun's heroism, and the theft of Lady Gralhun's necklace of fireballs never happened. The Nimble Rite's affiliation with the Zentarum is also a lie. The Gralhun's account further doesn't explain why the Nimble Rite would use the necklace of fireballs to inflict harm on the Zents if it was working for them. If the characters raise that question, Cromley thinks for a moment then ventures a guess that the Nimble Rites underestimated the necklace's explosive power. Investigate the Villa The characters can insert themselves into Gralhund Villa and accost its residents with impunity if they're careful to pin the violence on Zents, or if they're able to enter and leave unseen before the City Watch shows up to arrest everyone. Sneaking in or out of the Villa, without being seen or heard by neighbours and passers-by, requires each character to succeed a DC-15 dexterity stealth check. A character who has proficiency in the stealth skill can take disadvantage on the check to grant advantage on other party members' checks, essentially compensating for a less stealthy companion. If the characters side with Gralhunds in the conflict, Lady Gralhund is inclined to look over their trespass. Her demeanour sours, however, if they start asking too many questions. She vigorously denies accusations that her family is involved with the Black Network and claims the Zents were holding her family hostage, a false claim also parroted by her husband, her bodyguard, her children and her staff. If the characters assault any member of the house or brandish weapons in an attempt to intimidate, the Gralhuns inform the City Watch of the party's crimes. During the character's invasion of Gralhund Villa, the Nimble Rite flees the estate with the Stone of Galore, as described in Chapter 4. If the characters are using Nim's Nimble Rite detector to track the Nimble Rite, the device lets them know that the Nimble Rite has fled the scene, but not in the direction it went. Overview Gralhund Villa sits at the middle of an upper-class residential neighbourhood in the North Ward. There are some general facts to keep in mind. The streets around the villa have pedestrians and coaches travelling along with them at all hours, though traffic is heavier during the day. The estate is enclosed by a 12 foot high stone wall that requires a successful DC-15 strength athletics check to negotiate without the aid of climbing gear or magic. Neighbours and bystanders alert the city watch if they hear loud disturbing noises, such as a thunder wave spell, coming from the estate or if they see anything suspicious. The watch sends a mage and six veterans, one sergeant and five constables, to investigate, and it takes 1d6 plus 4 minutes for this force to arrive. All ceilings in the mansion are 20 feet high. Encounters in the Villa The following encounter locations key to the map 3.1 describe the Gralhund estate and where it stands when the characters first arrive. The Zents have taken over the downstairs level of the mansion. The Graal Huns are fighting to hold the upstairs. Area G1 Locked Gates Through a set of ornate iron gates, the characters can see a yard with several large trees, as well as two footpaths that lead to a two-story brick mansion and eastward towards a detached coach house. An arcane lock spell is cast on the gates, Forcing them open requires a successful DC-25 strength athletics check, while picking the lock requires a successful DC-20 dexterity check using thieves tools. 
The spell doesn't bar members of the Gralhun family, their staff, their guards, or Lady Gralhun's nimble right from opening the gates. Area G2, the yard. The estate is well tended. In spring and summer, large trees provide shade. The trees begin to shed their leaves in the fall. By winter, their branches are stripped bare. Balcony. Through the trees, the characters can see a large balcony, area G17, enclosed by an iron railing above the mansion's main entrance. The balcony is 20 feet above ground level, and scaling the mansion's brick walls to reach it without the aid of climbing gear or magic requires a successful DC-15 strength athletics check. Evil Groundskeeper The yard is looked after by a menacing groundskeeper named Herve Taldred, a lawful evil male Alaskan cult fanatic, and his two quiet mastiffs. The Gralhuns paid a necromancer to perform a ritual on Herve and his mastiffs. After sundown, the physical forms of these figures melt away, and they become three shadows until dawn characters who succeed on a DC-13 dexterity stealth check can cross the yard without being detected. Otherwise, Herve and his hounds detect the characters and attack, day or night. Area G3, Coach House. This stone building contains a beautifully maintained coach and clean stables that house four draft horses and Lady Gralhun's jet black riding horse named Maladar. A sliding wooden door bars access to the street and has a padlock on the outside that holds it shut. Picking the lock requires a successful DC-20 dexterity check using thieves tools. The larger room north of the stables contains tack and harness for each horse, as well as bales of hay and yard tools. The smaller room in the northwest corner has two cots, one for the groundskeeper, Herve, as described in area G2, who sleeps during the day, and one for the stable boy, named Ike, a commoner, who sleeps here at night. Ike is away, either picking up food for the horses, or out drinking with friends, if the characters arrive during the day. Treasure Lady Gralhun's horse is outfitted with horseshoes of speed, and two saddlebags, each of which holds four five-pound gold trade bars, worth 250 gold pieces each. Area G4, the Guard Barracks. This one-story stone building attached to the mansion serves as quarters for 20 house guards. The main room contains 10 bunk beds. Each comes with a pair of footlockers containing folded clothes and worthless personal effects. The room in the northwest corner contains wooden mannequins and racks designed to hold armor and weapons. Since there are no guards present, the mannequins and racks are bare. Area G5, the kitchen. An unlocked wooden door leads from the yard to the mansion's kitchen, which is stocked with cookware and utensils. A large fireplace is used for cooking meals. Area G6, the pantry. The pantry is lined with shelves containing dry foodstuffs, spices, folded tablecloths, and jars of preserves. Casks of fresh water, ale, and wine are also stored here. Barred door. A back door leads out to the street. This sturdy wooden door is barred shut on the inside. Forcing it open from the outside requires a successful DC-20 strength athletics check and makes a lot of noise. Corpses. The Zents have killed two servants, an older male human, the head butler, and a younger male halfling, a cook, and left their bodies on the floor. Area G7, the laundry room. This room is where the servants wash clothing. It contains scrub buckets, wash basins, soap, mops, and chamber pots. Corpses. The Zents have killed a servant, a middle-aged female human, the head maid, and left her body on the stairs leading up to the servants' quarters in area G19. The maid has a ring of keys on her belt that opens all locked doors in the mansion, as well as the cabinets in area G8. Area G8, the Great Hall. Characters who enter this hall for the first time notice the following. The floor is strewn with bodies. Two thugs holding bloody maces stand over them. The sound of fighting can be heard coming from the top of a wide staircase in the northwest corner. 
as described in area G13. Two ironclad chandeliers hang from a dark mahogany ceiling above a long dining table carved from red larch wood. Chairs surround the table with a particularly tall and elaborate chair at each end. Lining the wood panelled walls are tapestries and locked wooden cabinets that contain fine dishware, silverware and candlesticks. A fireplace with a black marble mantelpiece has a framed family portrait mounted above it. The portrait depicts Lord and Lady Grahund, their three young children and a family dog that died three years ago. Corpses Lying about the room are the bodies of eight guards wearing bloodied and tattered House Grail Hund livery over their chain shirts, as well as two Zents in black leather armour. All are humans. Thugs The two figures with maces are Zents clad in black leather armour. Their orders are to hold the room. They attack strangers, including members of the City Watch on site. They carry no treasure. Area G9 The Parlour Burstall Floxen was confined here when he returned to the villa, but shortly thereafter, he killed his guards and escaped. The room is furnished for comfort and contains dainty chairs, a chase lounge, a wine cabinet, and a framed painting of various long-dead members of the Grahund family. Corpses The bodies of two guards lie atop blood-soaked rugs. The guards wear chain shirts and the livery of House Grahund. Area G10, the Den and Trophy Room. Lord Grauhun's den has the heads of various beasts mounted on the walls and gleaming suits of armour standing at attention in the corners. Bearskin rugs and overstuffed chairs fill the room. Lord Grauhun recently took up falconry as a hobby. In the middle of the room resting on a table is a cage containing a hooded falcon. Use the hawk statistics. Area G11, or run study. The door to this room is locked. The lock can be picked by a character who makes a successful DC 15 dexterity check using thieves tools. The room has these features. A 10 foot square canvas wrestling mat is sprawled on the floor in the middle of the room. Velvet armchairs, small statues of naked men on pedestals and tall mahogany bookshelves are arranged neatly around the room. A mahogany desk in one corner doesn't look like it sees much use. Books Most of the books are fake boxes made out of painted cardboard. A few have bawdy drawings and salacious poems hidden inside of them. Area G12 The Family Library The wood panelled library includes these features. Tall wooden bookshelves are packed with tomes. Sliding wooden ladders mounted on rails allow easy access to higher shelves. In one corner stands an iron lectern with a closed locked leather bound tome resting on it. Two padded chairs face a large fireplace. One has a wolf skin draped over it. Books Many of the books were handed down to Lady Grahund by her parents and they are well kept. They include historical texts, play scripts, novels and poetry collection. Locked Tome Although it looks like it might be a spell book, the tome on the lectern is a chronicle of the Grahun family's accomplishments, embellished or recast to paint the family in the most favourable light. A detect magic spell reveals an aura of abjuration magic emanating from the tome. The tome is meant to be unlocked using a key that Lady Grahun wears on a chain around her neck. The lock can be picked by a character who succeeds on a DC 15 dexterity check using thieves tools, or it can be opened with a knock spell or similar magic. Opening the book by any means other than using the proper key causes three spectres to appear within 10 feet of the book and attack its opener. The magic that binds these spectres has weakened over time and they can exist on the material plane only for one minute after which time they are banished to the ethereal plane, unless destroyed first. The spectres manifest as ghostly tieflings with elongated fingers. The Grahun family crest appears on the book's title page. The rest of the book is written in common, describes births, deaths and other family events between 1239 DR, the year of the bloodied sword, and 1422 DR, 
the year of the advancing shadows. Of particular note is the little known fact that the Grelhuns forged a pact with devils in years past, giving rise to a strain of tieflings. All such members of the house were sent to live on a Grelhund estate in Yatar, a city far to the north, or so the book claims in its epilogue. There are passing references to some Water Davian family members having been born with tails. Area G13 Upstairs Foyer A lot is happening in this elegant foyer. A battle rages between several Zents and house guards. The floor is strewn with dead bodies. The door to the master bedroom in Area G16 stands open. If Lady Grahund is in the master bedroom, she shouts, The City Watch is on the way! The door to area G15A is ajar. Beyond it, characters can hear someone putting a boot to another door. Corpses. Lying on the floor are the corpses and weapons of six guards wearing House Grahund livery over chain shirts and two zents in black plain leather armor. Fight in progress. Four veterans of House Grahund, each with 30 hit points remaining, are fighting off an attacking force of Zents consisting of three thugs, each with 20 hit points remaining. The Zents are trying to get to area G16, but the guards are blocking them. If the characters do nothing to affect the outcome of this fight, assume that it ends with three House Grauhund veterans still alive and all the Zents dead. Area G14, the ballroom. The door to this room is locked. A character can use Thieves Tools to pick open the lock with a successful DC 15 dexterity check. The ballroom is unoccupied and contains the following features. Gilded mirrors, tasseled tapestries, and stained glass lamps festoon the walls. Mounted above the fireplace is a stag's head made of blown glass. A veined marble floor is polished to a mirror-like sheen. Tacky crystal chandeliers dangle from the ceiling which has a mural depicting an orgy painted on it. Area G15, the guest suite. Until recently, this suite was set aside for the use of Ursul Floxen. Lord Grauhund has barricaded himself in Area G15B, using heavy furniture to block the door. Forcing it open requires a successful DC 18 strength athletics check. Characters encounter Ursul Floxen in Area G15A. Erstel is wounded with 50 hit points remaining and has no poison coating his weapons, reducing his challenge rating to 3. He's trying to kick open the door to area G15B in a desperate attempt to capture Lord Grahund and trade him for the Stone of Galore. If he is accosted before reaching Lord Grahund, Erstel tries to flee the villa and uses any other surviving Zents to cover his escape. He knows the same information that Lord Grahan does, but won't divulge any of it or name his master Manshun unless he's magically compelled to do so. Area G15A is a bathroom. A curtain to the east has been drawn back, revealing a claw-footed bathtub. Area G15B is a wood-panelled bedchamber with a birdcage on a table and has a permanent teleportation circle inscribed on the floor. The birdcage contains three flying snakes that Erstel uses to deliver messages to his spies throughout the city. The circle is used by Manshun to secretly meet with Erstel Floxen and to teleport Zents to and from Colat Towers, as described in Chapter 8. See the teleportation circle spell description for more information on how the circle functions. Oron Grahund Having blocked the bedroom door with a wardrobe, a desk and an overstuffed chair, Oron Grauhund cowers behind a bed at the southwest corner of area G15B. Although he's armed with a rapier, Oron throws himself at the mercy of the first person to burst through the barricade. Oron Grauhund. The Grauhunds are nobles who trade in arms and mercenaries, and whose family motto is, We see both sides. Oron is the patriarch, but he's not a quick thinking or cultured sort and deep down he knows it. He leaves most of the plotting and socialising to his wife, Yalar, to whom he is devoted. When several of the masked lords were assassinated in quick succession some years ago, Lord Grauhund had expected his wife to fill one of the vacancies. 
That never happened though, despite many promises and bribes. After she was passed over, Orond became insanely angry, and he has remained that way ever since. Less than a year ago, the Grahlhuns were approached by agents of the Zentarum loyal to Manshun, and the nobles formed an alliance with them. House Grahlhund gives Zent's coin and allows them to use the family's noble villa as a refuge. In exchange, the house reaps all the benefits that the Black Network offers, including intelligence that spies have gathered. So while the Zents use House Grahlhund as a shield, the Grahlhunds are using the Zents to ascertain the identities and weaknesses of the Masked Lords. Orun doesn't fully grasp how entwined the Black Network and his family have become. It is now next to impossible to separate one from the other. It's no secret in Waterdeep that the Black Network has firmly rooted itself in House Grahlhund. But what's not generally known is that the Zents in House Grahlhund are agents of Manshun. Neither Orund nor any other member of his family knows about the wizard's clone. As far as Orund and his wife are concerned, the local leaders of the Black Network, with Erstal Floxen chief among them, reside with them in the family villa. Orund is a short, stocky man who dresses well and is easy on the eyes. When he opens his mouth, his boorish nature inflated sense of self-importance, fragile ego, and despicable opinions about the common rabble come to the fore, and his charm quickly dissipates. When not in his wife's company, he is prone to excessive boasting and temper tantrums. When he must speak to strangers, he keeps his half walk bodyguard, Harabaz, close by, for fear that others might attack or rob him at any moment. While in Yalar's presence, Orun becomes altogether a different person, quiet, almost timid, and happy to let his wife have the spotlight. Orun relies on Yala to manage the Zentarum. He spends his days watching mercenaries train, paying bills, and ranting about the cost of doing business in the city. Although he is human, Orun was born with the tiefling's tail. The tail was amputated when he was a young boy, but the scar on his backside remains. Game Statistics Orun Grahund is a Tytherian human noble with these changes. Orund is neutral evil. He has an intelligence of 9 and a modifier of negative 1. Never one to bother learning other languages, he speaks only common. Characters who have Lord Grahund at their mercy can pry the following information from him with a successful DC-10 Charisma Intimidation check. But the check is made with disadvantage if Lord Grahund has reason to believe his wife can see or overhear the conversation. The Stone of Galore is some ancient creature transformed into an artifact. It knows the location of the hidden vault in Waterdeep containing half a million dragons. House Grahund has been bankrolling the Black Network in Waterdeep, including the plot to kidnap Rainy Neverember and the plot to steal the Stone of Galore from his father's gnome spy, Dalakar. My wife was frustrated with the Zents and their inability to secure the artifact. She gave a necklace of fireball to her mechanical servant and sent it out to help retrieve the stone. It was careless and caught the Zents in the fireball by mistake. Area G16, the master bedroom. The doors to this room have been thrown open. The room contains the following occupants and features. Yalar Grahund, wearing a breastplate and armed with a rapier, stands next to her well-dressed half-orc bodyguard, Harabaz. Yalar Grahund. The lady of House Grahund is no fool. She has a keen mind and the wisdom to discern friend from foe. She also has a husband who worships her and a house that has the resources of the Black Network at its disposal. Yala stays abreast of the events in the city, keeping tight rein on her children, and uses her station and her family's wealth to pry secrets from the lips of nobles, guildmasters, and commoners alike. Though her previous attempts to become Masked Lord have been thwarted, she believes it's only a matter of time until that honour is bestowed on her. Once she knows the identities and secrets of enough Masked Lords, Yalar is confident that she can bribe, blackmail, or extort her way into their ranks. From there, she plans to effect changes in the governments that will ensure House Grahund's prosperity for generations to come. 
Yala shares the services of a half-orc bodyguard with her husband, although Harabaz is more loyal to her than to him. She also uses Zentarum, who are based in House Gralhund, as her personal spy network, not realizing that the Zent's true master is Manshun. Most of her dealings are with the Zent master assassin, Erstel Floxen, whom she treats as an underling. Game Statistics Yalar Gralhund is a Tytherian human noble with these changes. Yalar is neutral evil. She has an intelligence of 16 with a plus 3 modifier. She speaks common and infernal. Harabaz Harabaz is a muscle-bound half-orc with a cleft palate who serves the Lord and Lady of House Gralhund as a bodyguard. He is well-mannered and dresses impeccably, a disarming appearance that belies a murderous heart. Though he has great respect for Lady Yala Gralhund, he is less fond of her moody husband and wouldn't be sad to see Oron knock down a peg or two. A locked wooden trunk rests at the foot of a large canopied bed in the southwest corner. A claw-footed bathtub sits at the northwest alcove near a freestanding mirror and a privacy screen. Hanging above a fireplace in the southeast corner is a shield that bears the Gralhan coat of arms. Logs are stacked neatly next to the hearth. A tall mahogany wardrobe stuffed with expensive gowns and dress clothes stands next to a pair of open glass doors leading out to a balcony. Yala Gralhund. Lady Gralhund gave the Stone of Galore and a map of where to take it to a nimble right servant who has left the villa by the time the characters reach this character. Its escape is crucial since it sets into motion the events in Chapter 4. Lady Gralhund and Harabaz are the only people who know where the nimble right has gone, but they feign ignorance when questioned about it. Yalar carries a ring of keys that opens all locked doors in the mansion, as well as the locked wooden trunk at the foot of the bed. If a situation turns dire, and Harabaz is unable to protect her, Yalar unlocks the door in Area G18, rushes inside, and locks the door behind her with her next action. She makes her final stand there, with her children cowering behind her. Wooden Trunk The lock on the trunk can be picked with thieves' tools and a successful DC-15 dexterity check. The trunk appears to contain folded clothes and shoes. A secret compartment in the bottom can be detected by someone who examines the outside of the trunk and makes a successful DC-15 wisdom perception check. The compartment contains two holy symbols of Asmodeus and robes, each one red and gold in colour. Lord and Lady Gralhund are both secret members of a cult of Asmodeus worshippers, popular among select nobles in Waterdeep. The cult is led by Lord Victorio Casalanta, though the Gralhunds don't divulge that information willingly. Area G17, The Balcony this large balcony is enclosed by an ornate wrought iron railing and has lounge chairs neatly arranged on it. The ground is 20 feet below, and open glass doors lead to the master bedroom in Area G16. Area G18, the children's room. The door to this room is locked. The lock can be picked with a successful DC-15 dexterity check using thieves tools. Three beds line the south wall, an empty cradle rests against the east wall. Other furnishings include squat wardrobes, play rugs, and children's desks. Children Confined here for their safety are the Gralhun's two youngest children, a 13-year-old boy named Zartan and a 10-year-old boy named Greth. Both are non-combatants. Their 18-year-old sister, Thomason, is visiting a tiefling cousin in Utah. Area G19, The Servant's Wing Three rooms in the southeast area of the upper floor are where the servants sleep at night. The head butler and head maid have rooms to themselves, but the places are mostly unoccupied. The largest of the three chambers is the common room containing six bunks for the junior staff. A total of nine maids, cooks and valets, commoners, are holed up here, waiting for someone to rescue them. They are armed with improvised weapons, rolling pins, mops, brooms and the like that are treated as clubs. Aftermath After fleeing Gralhund Villa with the Stone of Galore, Lady Gralhund's nimble right hides the artifact in a secret location in Waterdeep, setting the stage for Chapter 4. 
Even if the bloody conflict at Gralholm Villa goes unnoticed outside the walls of the estate, the carnage can't be hidden from the city watch for long. There are too many murdered servants and guards for anyone to conceal what has transpired. The arrival of the city watch foreshadows the return of Barnabas Blaswind and Saith Cromley, who arrive in due course with twenty constables, veterans, and two Griffin cavalry riders, astride Griffins. The Griffins and their riders remain airborne, providing aerial support and reconnaissance. Barnabas thoroughly investigates the Grolhund Villa crime scene and questions neighbours and bystanders. Characters who are noticed leaving the scene become suspects. If the characters killed any members of the Grolhund family and left witnesses or evidence of the act, Barnabas instructs Sergeant Cromley to arrest them for the crime of murdering a noble, which carries a death sentence if they're found guilty. Loose Ends You can use the following optional event to address what happens in the Zentarum in the aftermath. A bad time to be a Zent. Within days after the event that local broadsheets dubbed the Gralhan Villa Bloodbath, the City Watch cracks down on the Black Network. Even members of the Zentarum who have no known criminal ties are rounded up and interrogated, including Davil Starsong. Characters who are members of the faction are safe for the time being, as long as they keep a low profile. Otherwise, too, they are rounded up and questioned over a period of several days, until the Lords of Waterdeep ascertain the level of involvement in the violence at Gralhund Villa. The broadsheets jump on the bandwagon by portraying the Black Network in the most unflattering light, thus dealing a crippling blow to the faction's already questionable reputation. Encounter with Istrid Horn this encounter occurs only if the characters were directly involved in the events that transpired at Gralhan Villa. After Davil Starsong is taken for questioning, Istrid Horn sends a message to the characters by way of a flying snake. The message, written in common, reads as follows. I would like to know more about what happened at Gralhan Villa. If you can spare the time, meet me at a Karan statue in the City of the Dead at High Sun tomorrow. You will be paid generously for your time and trouble. Istrid Horn If the characters attend the meeting, use the following description to set the scene, embellish it to reflect the season. Agharian statue is a well-known landmark of the city's park cemetery, a tall marbled sculpture of a bearded robed wizard standing atop concentric rings and facing west towards the skyline of Waterdeep his hands outstretched and a broad smile on his face. At the foot of the statue stands a female dwarf clad in plate armour. If the weather is fair, characters can see pedestrians, picnickers and frolicking children throughout the cemetery grounds. It's clear that Istrid chose a safe public place for the meeting. Characters who succeed on a DC-15 wisdom insight check can tell that she came alone. Istrid fears being arrested by the city watch, although she wasn't involved in the matter concerning Grolhund Villa. She is worried that the Watch will uncover her illegal currency trading operation in the course of its investigation. She offers the characters 10 platinum pieces just for meeting with her and promises another 40 platinum pieces if the characters agree to help her lie low for a 10 day, half to be paid once the deal is struck and half at the end of her stay. If they decline her offer, and the party includes one or more Zentarum members, she threatens that if she's arrested and charged with a crime, she will reveal their affiliation and bring them down with her. Hiding Istrid If the characters decide to let Istrid hide out at their tavern, she uses a disguise kit to make herself to be a male dwarf named Jorn. If asked to do so, she's willing to perform chores around the place once she settles in. Ultimately, no one comes looking for her, but the longer she stays hidden, the more testy and demanding she becomes. If the characters tolerate her bad behaviour, Istrid leaves at the end of the ten day as promised, and pays characters the remaining of what she owes. Characters who are members of the Zentarum gain the added benefit of harbouring Istrid in her time of need. Their renown in the faction increases by two. If, on the other hand, the characters throw her out, or rat her out to the city watch, Istrid becomes their mortal enemy and tries to undermine them at every turn. Harming Istrid As a precaution against being double-crossed, 
Istrid shared her plan concerning the characters with at least one other member of the Doom Raiders. If the characters betray or harm Istrid, her former adventuring companions use every resource at their disposal to ruin the characters. The laws of Waterdeep discourage them from attacking the characters openly, but they can damage the party's business by scaring off their clientele, and characters might find themselves targets of worse if they dare to leave the confines of the city. Level Advancement If you're leveling up the characters using story milestones instead of tracking experience points, the characters advance from 3rd to 4th level if they conducted their own investigation into the Fireball incident and affected the outcome of the events in Grolhund Villa. Otherwise, they are still 3rd level at the start of Chapter 4.